Live on WFLA Now, with a specialized degree in climate, Chief Meteorologist and Climate Specialist Jeff Berardelli is pioneering the way we look at climate and extreme weather. Welcome to Jeff's Climate Classroom, powered by Armor View Window and Door. All right, welcome everybody to this week's Climate Classroom. The topic of this week hits very close to home. A red alert for Florida's remaining and vulnerable corals. Now, we have record-shattering Gulf and South Florida water temperatures right now. Uh, temperatures we've never observed before in the Florida Keys and Florida Bay, Bay routinely getting into the mid-90s over the past two weeks. One site briefly getting to 98 degrees. Coral scientists are extremely concerned uh, that this year is going to be the quote-unquote death knell for Keys Coral with a severe coral bleaching event very, very possible. Okay, joining me now is a coral scientist from South Florida with 45 years of coral expertise under his belt. Welcome, uh, welcome, Bill Precht. I appreciate you joining me today. Jeff, it's my pleasure. I was about to call you William, but I figured you're Bill. I go professionally by William on my professional papers, but everybody calls me Bill. All right. So first things first, right off the bat, how dire is this situation? Jeff, as you said, I've been studying coral reefs for 45 years, and I'm looking at temperatures right now in Florida where they have never been before. We are looking at temperatures at the middle end of July that are exceeding the warmest temperatures that we've seen in past years at the end of the summer climatology, which is August, end of August, early September. So we're looking at temperatures right now in excess of the highest they've been at the end of the summer. So what scares me about that is not just are the temperatures hot, as you just shown on that graphic, five degrees above normal, five degrees Fahrenheit above normal, but that they could be there and they could even get hotter potentially for the next maybe eight to 10 weeks. And if we have record temperatures for eight, 10, 12, 14 weeks, we've, we're in uncharted territories of what that means in terms of stress to corals. We do know in past years when it's been not as hot as now for eight weeks that we've had excessive 100% of the corals bleach, a percentage of those die. So this year could, could trump all of that. It could make those numbers look, look pitiful. You can see the map I have up right there, eight weeks already in some parts of the Keys, going on, what, another month and a half at least, and the record Keys temperatures. You can see it right there, the black line off the charts, Bill. Yeah, and in fact, if you go back to that uh, graphic at some point, you can actually see that graph was an amalgamation of sea surface temperatures measured by NOAA's satellites. And we have basically a record a continuous record of temperature from 1985 until today. And right now, today, we are seeing temperatures where we haven't seen them since we've been recording these sea surface satellite temperatures in 1985. And not just are we in excess of those, but again, it looks like based on their trajectory that it could be really bad for a really long period of time. You know, I think it makes sense for me to kind of talk about and you to talk about what's underlying all of this. OK, so there's a lot of things that are going on right now. I'll talk about the weather angle and then I'll let you talk about the climate angle here. OK, sounds uh, great. We've had a weird weather pattern, folks, this year. Um, we have a big heat dome out west in the uh, especially in the deep southwest in Texas and Mexico. Now, on the east side of the U.S., we've had this trough, this dip in the jet stream. Here in Tampa, we've seen very little rain. We've had a westerly wind pattern this whole summer, which is really, really rare. Usually we get it a couple of days or, uh, you know, a couple of weeks of summer. It's been the whole rainy season so far. What that has done, that trough, that dip in the jet stream has actually pushed the high pressure in the Atlantic out into the Atlantic. It's not allowing it to move in. So winds across Miami and the Florida Keys have been really light. We haven't seen that typical nose of high pressure in. Um, and as a result of that, we've had very stagnant air and 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 you know with, with and stagnant winds. Thus, the waters have been somewhat stagnant, and the sun just kind of beating down on on the water 
in a sense of weather at least, has really helped to warm it up. So that's the weather uh, picture. And then you add into it El Nino, which we know is influencing the weather right now across the globe. How exactly that impacts ocean temperatures in the Atlantic, being that El Nino is in the Pacific Ocean, that's really hard for us climatologists and meteorologists to, to, to really zero in on. It's really difficult. It's called, they're called teleconnections. But what we do know is, is it's disrupting atmospheric weather patterns, which seem to be resulting in hotter temperatures across extreme South Florida. But then their bill is the climate change component, this steady drumbeat of warming over the past hundred years. Can you speak to that? Yes. So going actually to peer-reviewed literature, there was an amazing paper that was written by a woman by the name of Colleen Bove, who was a graduate student at the University of North Carolina. She published that paper with her advisor, John Bruno, uh, a year or so ago, and it was on sea surface temperatures in the Caribbean over the last 120 years. And what they were able to do was show that temperatures have been steadily increasing since about 1915. But somewhere around 1975, we hit a tipping point where they got exceedingly warm and it's been a nonstop shift of warmer and water temperatures year after year, decade after decade. So from a climatological standpoint, when we talk about climate, we're usually talking about a 30 year average or more. But in this sense, Again, like the sea surface temperature graph that, that NOAA has published there with that the graph on it. If you look at that graph, you'll see that by the colors that the temperatures when they started collecting in the 1980s were a blue-green color. And then in the 1990s, they were a yellow color, 2000s an orange color, and then more recently a red color. And basically by decade, the temperature has been shifting warmer and warmer and warmer. Mm -hmm. And that is directly related to global climate change. And you don't have to argue whether it's human induced, CO2 driven. We know that there is global climate change occurring right now. And it's clear as a bell. I believe it's related to greenhouse gas emissions. But what we're seeing is temperatures that are steadily on the increase decade after decade. And the last 10 years, or so have been the warmest 10 years of sea surface temperature ever recorded in the Caribbean, ever recorded in South Florida. And we're seeing simpler land temperatures. So we're seeing the warmest land pattern temperatures as well. So we have these super warm conditions, decade after decade, getting warmer and warmer. And then we have this El Nino cycle on top of that, superimposed on mm -hmm. those ever increasing temperatures. And El Nino cycles generally run on somewhere between three to seven year pulse averages. And when we have an El Nino condition, like we do right now, we generally see warmer conditions. We often see doldrum-like conditions. And when we have had those El Nino conditions in the past, we've had coral bleaching events. So every time we have a El Nino superimposed on the global warming signal, then we're basically looking at super warm temperatures, yep. increased coral bleaching, and and what goes with that, increased stress on the corals. So to add to what you were talking about, um, th this is kind of an amazing stat. It amazes me all the time. So about 90% of the excess heat that's being trapped on Earth right now, um, and again, you, you talked about, you know, we don't need to argue about why it's happening, but it is, in fact, happening. Um, and there are various reasons for it. Um, the biggest is, is greenhouse gases. Uh, is about 90% of the excess heat that's being trapped by that is, is being stored in our oceans. And so when you try to equate the amount of heat energy that's being stored in the ocean, uh, I think a very useful way of doing it is we use Hiroshima bombs because people are familiar with the amount of energy in an atomic bomb. It is 10 Hiroshima bombs per second that are being stored in the ocean from the excess heat that's being trapped due to climate change. And that is just building up and building up and building up. Now, in, in non-El Nino years, some of that is being stored in the deeper ocean. But during El Nino years, as the Central and Eastern Pacific warms up, it's being brought back to the surface, 
and then it's being pushed into the atmosphere. And when it does, it really makes for a lot of extreme weather all over the world. And we see that happening right now. Um, now, when weather patterns line up on top of what we talked about, the El, Nino, the El Nino cycle, but more so just this steady drumbeat of climate warming, and we have the weather patterns lining up on top of South Florida, you see extraordinary things that you've never seen before. I mean, look at the Northwest Atlantic right now. Water temperatures are about seven plus degrees Celsius above normal, so it's about 14 degrees Fahrenheit, and that'll be transient. That'll move from one part of the ocean to the other, but we're seeing things we've never seen before. And Bill, you knew that this was going to happen because anyone who follows the weather and climate knows El Nino was coming. And we knew we'd see unprecedented things. Look at that. Noah is saying that all of the Caribbean is under alert level two, including the Gulf of Mexico, basically the whole area uh, through the end of the summer and into the early part of the fall. And so that's what you're worried about. It's not just the intense, the intensity of the heat. Um, you're worried about the longevity of the heat, right? Right. And just so people know, for their bleach watch program, uh, alert level two is basically looking at by the end of the summer, there's a 90% or greater chance that all of that area that on your map was red is going to bleach. That's staggering. That's incredible. And considering, in Bill, past, you, uh, right, I was going to say, and considering, Bill, that you were saying that back in the 1970s, coral cover in the Florida Keys was at about 40%, 30 to 40%. Now it's only at 3% or less. Is it conceivable we may lose almost all the coral in the Florida Keys? Yeah, that's that's my greatest fear right now because we're, we're at such extremes and we could potentially be looking at such great levels of mortality related to this hot weather event that if we lose greater than 50% of what we have remaining, there won't be much left. And in fact, we could in some cases on some reef areas, maybe even lose 90% of what we have in, in the worst case scenario. And if that happens, essentially the reefs will be barren. It won't be totally dead, but it'll be horrific. Bill, there are so many people here in the Tampa Bay area and all across the state of Florida and the world who dive the Florida Keys. So what you're telling me is the heat is so intense and so prolonged that we may lose virtually all of the coral by the end of the summer and the fall. Is that possible? That that is a possibility. That's the worst case scenario, but it's a real possibility. It's not science fiction. It's it's a projection, but it's a real life projection based on what's happened in the past and where we are today. Like I said earlier, right now we have temperatures higher than they've ever been recorded in the Florida Keys before. And those hot temperatures are usually not recorded until the end of August, early September. We're talking about these temperatures hitting these records in the middle of July with the two warmest months yet to come for sea surface temperatures. So if the temperatures just stay where they are or slightly increase, the amount of heat stress on these corals for a long period of time is, is potentially tragic. And like I said earlier, the longer a coral is stressed, the more likely it is to die. So if we have eight, 10, 12 weeks of excessive heat stress, and those corals are stressed for that length of time, there's a good chance they'll die. So there's a couple of things that not- I've been I've been following this closely, and uh, and and I noticed that you 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 mentioned uh, the bottom temperatures. Someone had their dive watch. Uh, he was at about 27 feet, and I think water temperatures were at somewhere around 90 30, Fahrenheit, right? 31 de- 31 degrees Celsius, 87.9 degrees Fahrenheit. At, at depth. And even 70 feet down. Yeah, same temperature. Right, so I think people same need, temperature. anybody who dives can understand what we're talking about here. Uh, so let's so, talk about this. So what's the, what would the, what would the average water temperature be in the Florida Keys? Couple things. First, what would the average temperature be, you know, earlier in the 1900s? What would the average water temperature be right now, you know, in this era uh, of the past decade? And what are the right. and how much above above that are we right now, Bill? Okay, so let's talk because everybody talks degrees Fahrenheit. Right, we'll make it easy. Th- thank you. So, <laughs> in the middle of July, in the middle of July, where we are, where we, these temperatures have been recorded over the last week, we would be like in the 1970s and 80s. We'd be looking at sea surface temperatures at about 84 degrees. 
this time of year. Right, 84. And at depth, we'd be looking at temperatures at like 81 degrees. And this is when? This is earlier in the 1900s? Just or- like like 30, 40 years ago. Okay. so Like in the 1970s, 1980s. So we should be somewhere and- in the mid-80s for, for surface temperatures and low 80s for bottom temperatures. For this, this time of the year, in okay. middle of July. That's okay. correct. And then at the end of the summer, we would have been looking at temperatures approaching 86, 87 degrees Fahrenheit at the surface and maybe 84, 85 degrees at depth. Where are we now? And then, and then in the, in the, you know, we started seeing bleaching events, the first major one in 87, a very big one in 98, another one in 2005. And what we were seeing in this escalation, this ever upward increase in temperature. So over the last decade, summertime temperatures were instead of being in the in the eight like 86 degree temperature range they were like 88 89 degrees and at depth instead of being at 81 82 degrees they were at 84 85 so there was a couple degrees fahrenheit shift over a three decade period of time right now this summer we're looking at degrees fahrenheit in the area of five degrees above that average. So we're in the low 90s, right? Yeah, in upper 89 to 92 degrees for sea surface temperatures and 86 to 89 degrees for bottom temperatures. And like you pointed out, there are some places in shallow embayments, like in Florida Bay, where temperatures have been recorded at 98 degrees. Water temperatures as warm as the air. So I think people need to understand why it matters, right? People are thinking to themselves, okay, so it's a couple of degrees warmer, a few degrees warmer, several degrees warmer. Why does that matter to coral? Coral, the animal itself, lives at its upper thermal tolerance. So the warmest temperatures, say we're 86 degrees, that's about as warm as the coral animal liked it. So now if it gets warmer than that 86, 87 degree thermal optimum, all of a sudden, the coral gets stressed. And corals, if, if anyone has seen pictures of coral, been a diver, you, you see they're beautifully colored. And the reason they're colored is they have a, what's known as a symbiotic association with an algae. It's called zooxanthellae. And these algal cells live in the tissue of the coral animal. And they have chlorophyll in them. That's what gives them the color. And because they have chlorophyll, they photosynthesize. So they basically do the oxygen and uh, CO2 respiration. But that nutrient association and that process of the uh, the photosynthesis and the chloroplast in the zooxanthellae basically is a way that the coral animal gets nutrition. And when the coral gets stressed for a long period of time, the first thing it wants to do is go into a self-preservation mode. And the self-preservation mode is to expel that zooxanthellae algae, that symbiotic algae. So when it expels that algae, the coral becomes white in color. And it's because it's now colorless. It expels those things that gave it its color. And now it's just left with its white limestone skeleton. So it's clear tissue, animal tissue, over a, a white skeleton. And... If the temperature, like that, like that picture there, exactly. Mm-hmm. And if the coral stays stressed for a long period of time, they won't regain that zooxanthellae. They won't regain that algae. And if they don't regain that algae, they literally starve to death and they die. And that's the great fear is they're going to be stressed for such a long period of time and at such high temperatures that they'll bleach, but they won't recover from that bleaching and they'll die. And we don't know how bad it's going to be yet. But again, based on the, the temperatures that we're seeing and the potential length of this heat wave, uh, the mortality could be catastrophic. So I think, you know, it's important to kind of put this into some perspective. Um, I feel like just in my lifetime, I've noticed a real degradation to the coral in the Florida Keys. And I've spent a decent amount of time in the Keys and a decent amount of time underwater in the Keys. I know that you are not just an expert in coral bleaching, but also in um, coral disease, right? Uh, Stony coral tissue loss disease, which is something that you kind of, uh, I think, discovered. Is is that right? Yes, we did. My 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 the team that I work with, 
We discovered that disease in 2014 in Miami-Dade County, and then we followed its spread throughout Florida, and now it is spread through the Caribbean. And that disease affects some 25 species of Caribbean coral, Florida coral, and the mortality levels of some of those corals has been greater than 50% that in the eight years that we followed the disease spread. It's, it's, it, it in and of itself is catastrophic. And there is a likely link to warm water there as well, because the year that it kicked off was 2014. It's the year the disease was first noted. And it followed right on the heels of a coral bleaching event, which 2014 up until that point had been the warmest year on record. And the corals were bleached. But then as the temperatures got cooler in the fall, they started to recover their color. They started to recover their zooxanthellae. And then for whatever reason, the corals were stressed, a pathogen came through and because the corals had been stressed, they caught whatever that disease was. And to this day, we still don't know whether that disease is bacterial or viral in origin, but the corals came down with this syndrome basically where it lost, rapidly lost tissues and died. And it was separate, different from bleaching, but there was this link to the temperature stress of the previous year, of the previous season. So oftentimes what we're seeing is it's a one-two punch. Right. It's coral bleaching and coral disease. In some cases, it's coral disease followed by coral bleaching. All right, I have another question. Could it be a three punch? And what I mean by that is could the excess nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, you know, that ratio between the two, could that also be contributing? I mean, obviously there's a lot more stuff that is just spewing into the water around Florida. Could it also be pollution weakening the coral or no? Yes. And actually where we first saw stony coral tissue loss disease break out in Miami-Dade County was a stone's throw from the wastewater treatment plant outfall pipe of the Miami Central Dade Wastewater Treatment Plant off of Virginia Key. How, and, how far offshore was that? And I say that because I fished off of Miami Dade, and sometimes when you get out there, you, you see all the boats congregating around these areas where the water is bubbling up. Bo boiling up, right. Right, and it's boiling so, up, and it's coming from right. outflow, which essentially is wastewater, right? right? I just, I just, yes. I could not believe it's the first time I was at, I couldn't believe right, the first time I saw that. <laughs> I couldn't it's believe it. It's treated wastewater. Oh, yes. yes. But it's it's wastewater nonetheless. Yeah. And there's lots of still microorganisms and bacteria in there. And there's still the nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, untreated in a wastewater treatment plant. Um, so what you were saying is, where is the pipe? And so the, the, the wastewater treatment plant at Virginia Key handles about 150 million gallons of wastewater a day from Dade County, from Miami. And it's... After it's treated, it goes out of pipe and then just basically spews in 110 feet of water out off the Florida reef track about huh. a mile. I off. have to stop you. 110 feet of water off of Miami-Dade, not very far. 110 feet of water off uh, Tampa, very, very far. How far offshore right. are we talking? Uh, about a mile. Mile. Well, not very from, far at all. From the reef line, right. Not very far. But the outfall pipe, was there was a trench that was dug. The pipe was laid in the trench, and then they backfilled the trench, covered it up, and that basically goes from the wastewater treatment plant through the reef line. It's it's the trench, it's trenched through, and then it expels out in a hundred feet of water. But unfortunately, because the piping is so old, that that pipe springs leaks all the time. Mm. So this is an old facility that's deteriorating. So we have leaks along the line that are have been known for, for decades. And the Miami-Dade Water and Sewer does their best to fix mm -hmm. them. But again, it's, it's yeah, a never-ending battle, of right, course, with, course. with infrastructure. In so, addition, yeah. I was going to say, what we have here is also when we have excessive rainfall events, if we have a tremendous amount of storm influx into the wastewater treatment plants, in addition to the sewage, then what we're seeing is sometimes when we exceed that 150 million gallons a day, plant can handle it and raw wastewater Ugh. actually bypasses the plant. Oh, I don't want to think and about that. It looks that. like that may have happened a couple times in September of 2014. Interesting. Interesting. Huh. 
A lot of people now. A lot of people living not, in South Florida. And, yeah. Yeah, it's not a smoking gun right. because again, we can't directly link a pathogen with the wastewater treatment sure. plant with the coral disease. Sure. But there is correlative analysis, and correlation doesn't always equal causation. But in this case, uh, it 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 really looks like it it, it could have been certainly a contributing factor. Okay, I think that the question we need to ask now, because we're kind of running out of time, is, look, there are a lot of efforts uh, around the state of Florida and around the world to try to restore coral reefs, to somehow figure out how to really um, isolate the strains of coral that uh, are the most robust to warming, to maybe even um, engineer coral to be stronger in a warmer climate. Um Coral fragmentation. I did a story on that down in the Florida Keys. You know all about that. Yes. Can any of these really help, or is it too late? Does it is it too slow a process? For this for this bleaching event that's happening in 2023, it's too late. But the research that's been ongoing, if we can scale that up, if we can find these genotypic strains, these genetic strains of coral that are heat resistant and or disease resistant or both. And we can then reproduce these in a laboratory setting or in a coral nursery setting, and then outplant those on the reef. We do have the shot at restoring the reefs from the exact causes that caused their loss in the first place. But right now we don't have the technology to know which are all the genotypes mm -hmm. and we don't have the ability to scale that up. So for instance, somebody asked me the other day in an interview, what can we do now today? And my answer was nothing. Mm -hmm. And the answer is nothing was, and my daughters actually got on my case about it. They said, well, th there's a lot we can do. And one of them is education. Yeah. The important part of this thing, what's happening right now is we can educate people on how bad it is so we can change the future. If right. we don't do that, we're, we're doomed to failure. But it's kind of like a hurricane. If a hurricane was coming and we were in the feeder bands of a hurricane and you said, what could we do about this hurricane? There's nothing that you or I or any politician could do to stop a hurricane from hitting where it's going to be. Right. So that's where we are right now. The first bands, the feeder bands of this heat wave are already hitting us yeah. and the corals are already starting to bleach. Right. That's, so so do you have, I know that in Belize, the corals are bleaching already. Do you have a confirmation that it's happening in the Florida Keys as well? Yes. Um, so in Belize, they first started to see corals bleaching in the middle of June. And they have photos that they've shared with us from the last week. And there's some significant coral bleaching, especially in shallow water in Belize. A bunch of my friends, some of my staff have been diving in the past week, and I've been in constant communication with these folks. And a woman uh, from the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary reported the other day that on her dive, the bottom temperatures were 89 degrees, and she saw corals that were paling. So they were starting to bleach mm -hmm. on her dives, and she dove at multiple locations. So it is starting in Florida, which is what we'd expect. Belize is ahead of us by a couple of weeks, which is also they're more southern than us, mm -hmm. warmer temperatures earlier. So it's it's grim. Yeah, I can hear that. Well, that is too bad. I do hope that we can figure out. I mean, obviously, there's nothing we can do for this year, but I do hope as we go forward, we can figure out how to you know, sustain these reefs. I mean, it is amazing to think it took tens of thousands of years for these reefs to grow and humanity is destroying these reefs, not in a century, but literally in a few decades. I mean, that's what's happening. Yeah. In my lifetime. Yeah. And what I saw as a young scientist, my daughters have never seen. Well, I, I think that uh, it would be nice if people, you know, could wake up to what's going on. I think that there are a lot of people who are in some sort of denial. And I don't mean that they're denying it on purpose. There are some people who just don't want to hear it. There are some people who don't believe it. Then there are just some people who just, it's so big. It's so big. How can I do anything about it? I know that I can recycle, right? I can put the plastic in the glass. I can help a little that way. But um, there's nothing I can do about something that is so regional or so global, which is essentially what's happening right now. And I think a lot of people, 
just are trying to put food on the table and it's hard for them to really think about these really big picture things that they don't feel like they have any control over that, you know, in many cases, perhaps even governments don't have much control over because there are lots of governments in the world. Right. So, you know, there was a, an environmental motto when I was going through college that was act locally, think globally. Mm -hmm. And that's still the same today. Right. So there are things that we can do locally to improve water quality, improve conditions, to make things better for our marine environment. It's we live in the richest nation in the world. It's 2023. Mm -hmm. There are certain things that we should be doing that we should be doing better. We should be treating our wastewater better. We should be recycling more. We should be doing all these things, controlling our stormwater runoff. We shouldn't have septic tanks leaking into our shallow water environments. We shouldn't be dumping wastewater in outfalls into the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah. There's a lot of things like that that we can improve on. However, that alone won't solve this problem. It's got to be a global solution right. as well. Right. But we have to work locally as well. It can be a global yeah. solution once everybody is understands and is participating, right? Once there's a tide of people, just everyday people like you and me and everybody else, who really starts to reconnect with nature again, realizes that this is our sustenance. At that point, it's grassroots. It takes off and it changes the world. It does and it can happen. It's going to happen. It's going to have to happen uh, in the future. Um, I think people have a little more power than they realize they have, but you're right. It's not their fault. It's no one person's fault. The system is such that it's, it's, it's been, the system itself has been, has been, you know, essentially established for hundreds of years now. It, and if you don't believe hundreds of years, at least decades and decades, and this is the way we live, it's very hard to change the way we do stuff. But in order to truly reel in this problem, uh, there has to be systemic change, and it comes Jeff, yeah, from yeah. the bottom. Yeah, You and I are scientists, so we look at this, and we see the data, and we say, oh, it's pretty clear. These are the things we have to do to get off that train, to change the future. Yeah, And we're dealing with – everybody's not a scientist. Right. So it's, it's not a question of convincing people, but it's up to people like you and me and doing shows like this. Mm -hmm. Remember, my daughter said – that there's something we can do. And what are we doing? We're educating Education, people exactly. about this event. Exactly. Yeah. And these are the ways that we change things one voice at a time, one person at a time, and we get a movement going. And then all of a sudden they talk to their politicians who then enact policy right. that then changes the future. That's what we need. Right. We essentially are just trying to save the environment here. I mean, there are a lot of people who think that there's some type of, uh, you know, um, you know, conspiracy or something that there's some, but essentially we're just trying to save the earth, right? And we're just trying to save our local environment more specifically here in, in South Florida. All right, Bill, thanks a lot. I just want to say uh, you've been great. This has been really informative. And, uh, and uh, hopefully as, as we go through summer, the weather pattern changes and we're able to kind of cool down these water temperatures, but hope is not a solution, right? We have to, we have to do better than that. We, you know, well, Jeff, my, just because of my work schedule, I will be diving in the waters of South Florida for about 75 of the next 125 days, about four days a week, I'm okay. going to be in the water. So I'm going to see what unfolds this summer, almost on a daily basis. So I will keep in touch with you. I'll send you photographs on a regular basis. I'll keep you informed on okay. what's going on. Yes. I and hopefully know. it won't be as bad as we think. Yes, that would be but great. If it is, we are forewarned. Right, exactly. All right, Bill Precht. Bill has been doing this for 45 years, a coral marine scientist in South Florida, so right here in our neck of the woods. And again, this is a, a story that deserves a lot of attention, so I want to call your attention to our website. I wrote a, a, a long a article about this. Uh, Bill was included in this article. Make sure you go to WFLA.com and check out that story right there that you see. I want to thank you for joining Climate Classroom. We'll be back again either next week or the week after, once again discussing one of the biggest climate topics of our time. Uh, whatever it happens to be two weeks from now, but there's certainly a lot going on in the world right now uh, in the climate space, a lot of extreme weather and so on and so forth. Thank you for joining me, and I will see you again in the next week or two.
Watch or listen to Jeff's Climate Classroom, powered by Armor View Window and Door on WFLA social media platforms. And find Jeff's Climate Reports on WFLA.com.